Um, those of you who were uh, expecting to see Mark Yancey and have seen him speak before, bummer. For those of you who have seen me speak before, double bummer. Um, well, I'll try to do my best. Uh, since baseball season started, I figured it would be appropriate that I would have to pinch hit, although I wasn't that good of a hitter, so hopefully this will go a little better. But um, I wanted to really just talk about um, what we're seeing in the, in the industry and um, talk about a little bit about the trends, which I think we all know. Um, how are carriers handling this explosion in data demand? And then leave off with sort of what I see in the market, which I think is a good dovetail into the panel after lunch. I think we all know devices are exploding. If you go back just not that many years ago, 200 million devices all feature phones. Um, come forward to last year, uh, an estimate of almost up to 300 million with a big jump obviously in smartphones, but later on that, another 80 million tablets. So almost doubling uh, of the number of devices. Take it forward another seven years, you see that the feature phones go away pretty quick. I think actually 46 million US feature phones in seven years is uh, unlikely. My uh, niece has a new boyfriend and he's referred to as Flip Phone Larry. So my guess is that, 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 that tells me there won't be seven years more of that. Um, but you can see a staggering growth in smartphones and then staggering growth in uh, tablets and other devices. And this includes, you know, cars, all the car, uh, you know, the intelligent car, uh, intelligent auto, but, you know, 600 million devices, so tripling in 14 years. That's the device side. Now, on the usage side, you know, real quick, if you just focus in the middle, it's going from basically uh, data demand of one meg per sub to 350 roughly today to three and a half gigs per sub um, in seven years. And I have no doubt that's happening and will go faster. So if all you did to solve that was do, use cell sites, um, you, this would, one forecast says that we would go from about 300,000 cell sites to 4.3 million. I guess my work here is done. Uh, yeah, that'd be pretty good, but clearly that ain't happening. So what is happening? Basically, and this uh, dovetails with what Jonathan uh, was saying last night, uh, there's really three things carriers can do to meet the demand. One, they can have new spectrum. They can deploy new spectrum either by buying it from somebody who already has it, repurposing it, or getting it from the government, but they can take spectrum uh, and deploy new spectrum. Two, they can deploy what they have more efficiently. So 4G is more efficient than 3G, which is more efficient than 2.5G. Um, they're refarming what they have. They're splitting their deployments in terms of the frequencies, and I'll talk about that a little more. Um, and, and, and pushing the users to more efficient handsets. So Verizon doesn't sell any 3G handsets because they're not as efficient as 4G. And already about 50% of the data usage on Verizon's network is LTE. That's pretty fast. And then lastly, sites, right? And there's all flavors of sites, macro sites, small cells. There was a quote at last CTIA that said, millions and millions, my board loved that. I got a lot of questions about that. It was really fun. Um, they're like, what is it? I don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is, but we're starting to get a handle on it. But my new favorite word is densification. The densification of the network, that's cool. Um, and then, of course, DAS and Wi-Fi play a big role. So, just looking real quick at a couple of these. So, new spectrum, you can see in the, um, in the 90s and then again in the mid-2000s, there were auctions of spectrum. Uh, in, you know, before that, not a lot of spectrum was put out there. Now that the government knows they can sell it, they do. Uh, but we haven't had any in a while. If you look forward, and this is just an example, um, there's no pure crystal ball here. But if you look forward and you say, okay, where will it come from? Um, you know, estimates say 200, 220 megahertz are available. That would be a 40% increase, but it's gonna take a while. And I think um, it's kind of, you know, the dish spectrum will, will, will be utilized, probably light squared. The AWS that's already out there, 
But I think as you get to the upper right, you know, the right hand side of this um, chart, it's really speculative. And if you listen to what the FCC is saying and what what's likely to happen, there's probably not going to be new spectrum during the, this administration. Uh, it's almost we're almost out of time, so we'll see. But I think there will be uh, spectrum coming into the market. Uh, just not new auctions. It's very tough to take spectrum away from who has it, and it's a political football, and politicians don't like to step up to tough stuff. Social Security, anyone? Um, so they're not going to tackle this one. So on the efficiency side, um, this chart just shows that if you just go back to GPRS, and we all, some of us remember GPRS, um, LT is nine times as efficient and LTE Advanced is 16 times efficient. So just what's being deployed is more and more efficient in terms of using the spectrum, and that's how you can get more capacity. Oh, too fast. Okay. Um, the other thing the carriers do is they shift the devices, as I mentioned. So if you look on the left, the big, you know, the big chunks are um, what kind of devices, and as you go out in the future, there's this aggressive push to get LTE devices and more advanced devices and get rid of the, the older, you know, GSM phones are still out there, get rid of the 3G voice phones, move everything up the food chain because it's more efficient for the carrier. Um, the other thing that I think we're going to start seeing, which um, is that Carriers don't yet hear optimized by frequency band. You know, it used to, and we, I think we all know not all spectrum is created equal, but it used to be that, you know, the beachfront spectrum was 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz. Not really. Depends what you're using it for. And that's, that's a bit of a change. Um, the beachfront stuff is ideal for broad coverage, but and we all, you know, 700 is better than 1.9, right? It's better than 2.5. But the higher bands are actually better for dense demand areas because, and, and adding capacity in those areas because they actually interfere, they don't propagate as far, so interference management is easier. And if you have a network where you have a low, low frequent, lower frequency macro network and then a underneath high capacity, higher frequency network, they don't interfere with each other as much. So I think that's where we're going to see some changes in the next few years. To date, it's been one size fits all. Um, Verizon, you know, uh, basically Sprint's a good example. They're deploying LTE at 1.9. But really what they want to do, if this works, is they really want to shift it to the 800. And then they're going to use the 2.5 from Clearwire for capacity hits. So I think we will see a shift in network segmentation just, just to be more efficient. But I love this slide, because what this shows is over time, right, the devices, as you shift to the right, are the more advanced devices, right? So the green in the middle is 4G, to the left is 3G and 2.5G, to the right is 5G, et cetera. But on the right-hand side, what it shows is the more efficient device you have, the more data you use. And that is really holding true. Uh, if you look at that circle, that's 5G. Huge jump from where we are today. I don't know what 5G is, but these guys are really smart and I like their slides. Communication uh, <laughs> media advisors, they let me use their slide, I give them a plug. Uh, but it, it, so far it's proving true. And just a couple data points for you. One, Informa, which is a large uh, international uh, data company, in South Korea, LTE usage increased 132% versus 3G. So users that upgraded to LTE started using 132% more data. In Japan, it's 67%. But see, I don't, I don't believe in all these data companies. A little survey in my household. So one, very scientific, so one Gelman teenager his, his uses when he shifted to LTE went up three times. He's not flip phone Larry, that's for sure. So lastly, our favorite topic, right, sites. So what, what have they been doing? First of all, they've been overlaying LTE on existing networks. So not a lot of macro sites, not a lot of new sites, many, many more amendments. 
smart because it is more efficient for them. And oh, damn, I got a twitchy finger here. Um, so I think we all know there have been a lot of amendments going a lot less macro sites over the last couple of years. There's also three other technologies out there, Wi-Fi, DAS, and small cell. Clearly Wi-Fi is here, DAS is here. I don't know, is small cell here? I don't think it's here yet. I'd say it's coming, right? But it depends how you define it, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But a couple of key points is, one, Wi-Fi off offloading is very widespread. Um, we all use it. We all use it religiously. I do at, at the office, at home. I'm already on Wi-Fi all the time at the hotel. I'm chasing my uh, teenager to like, are you on Wi-Fi? Please. Um, DAS is DAS and small cell economics really work in dense demand areas, and I'm going to show you a little more perspective on that. But and also they work where in really tough zoning environments. And I think. Really, DAS and small cell use it sometimes interchangeably because they are going to outdoors, they'll tend to merge together. So on the Wi-Fi side, this is just a chart that shows that over 60% of traffic is already offloaded onto Wi-Fi. So that story's kind of happened, and it's not really going to see change from here. It's going to be more about outdoor. So picture worth a thousand words. This really just shows what a macro cell on the top, what macro cells cover on the bottom, what's, what DAS or small cell look like. It's only when you get over on the right hand side that the economics start to work. Because every one of those circles requires some kind of acquisition, some kind of backhaul, some kind of equipment, some kind of entitlement, uh, power, rental, etc. So if you have four macros and it's going to take 40 small cells. Small cells are not economic and the carriers won't do it. They will not want to do it. Um, I've seen a lot of estimates, but generally they seem to range from 8 to 12 DAS nodes to equates to a macro cell, dense urban areas. The exception being where you can't build for zoning purposes. And there's, there's a lot of places like that. So where have we been? I think I like to call it Amendment City. I don't know if you saw, but Crown in their uh, last quarterly release said 85% of their leasing came from amendments. Uh, that's high, but uh, it does illustrate that we have massive 4G overlay projects. You all know that. Um, there's also been a scramble for fiber to the tower, so the focus has all been on LTE and what, what the carriers have to do to uh, accommodate it. Not much time or capital for macro sites the last couple of years. Numbers are way down from what they were um, because of all the amendments. And I think ODAS, out, outdoor DAS, lost a lot of velocity after Metro and Cricket launched. It did not sweep urban America the way, um, you know, some people thought it might. So where are we right now? Right now, it's a great time to be in our industry. One really interesting thing, and actually, uh, Ben, I saw, I saw Ben Moreland uh, make this point, so I'm stealing it from him. So anybody from Crown Tall, I give him credit. Um, used to be, we always had one year of visibility on what the carriers were going to do, right? Right around this time of year, we'd sort of start to figure out what the capital budget is for the big guys and what they're going to spend this year, but it was only one year. And now, we pretty much have really good visibility out two, three, or more years with the big carriers. That's really a change, and I think the biggest example would be the um, AT&T's project uh, VIP announcement. I mean, I don't recall seeing a detailed... 100 page PowerPoint. Oh, am I not supposed to have that? Sorry. Um, but there's a huge PowerPoint detailing everything that they're going to do over the next three years in capital. And it lays out we're going to add 10,000 macro sites, we're going to have 1,000 DAS systems, we're going to do 40,000 small cells. That's really cool because there's a lot more visibility. It's good for financing, it's good for, for the markets, it's good for planning. Uh, it, it, so we're, we're living in good times here. Um, so AT&T is going to complete their uh, LTE sometime, probably mid-year next year, um, and they're going to roll right into Project VIP. The estimates I've heard uh, are about 1,400 macros for AT&T each of the last two years, company-wide. Um, 10,000 over the next three means maybe something like 2,000 this year as they ramp up, but like 4,000 
in 14 and 4015. Big jump. It's good news. Verizon is pretty much winding up LTE, um, but AWS deployments are coming, uh, which will be for capacity, not on every site, but also new rings coming out of Verizon as well. It's just still an arms race. I think you know everybody knows about Network Vision. Sprint is uh, planning to complete that next year. I think it'll spill over. Uh, IDEN's getting turned off in three months. Um, I think that will happen. It's easier to turn off than turn on. Um, and then Timo's very focused on their modernization project rolling along. Again, I think that that will uh, be hot and heavy all this year and into next year, but I do think they'll finish that project next year, but it's not their whole network. It's only about two thirds or a little less of their site, so there'll be more to come from them. Now the bad news is we're pretty concentrated, right? In the past, we've had Cricket build-outs, Metro build-outs, Clearwire build-outs that have driven our industry. Um, that's a thing of the past, right? Below the top four, there's been an incredible amount of consolidation. So the good news is the big four are all building at the same time. The bad news is there's not really anybody else. I don't know if there ever will be anybody else as far as a fifth national provider. Um, so for now it's good down the road, we'll see. As long as they're healthy and competitive, it shouldn't be bad for us. And then a huge buzz about small cells. I don't think we'll see a lot of it this year, but we're gonna certainly talk about it. So, what's coming? Crystal ball is kind of funny because, you know, I'm not the best predictor. Just check my NCAA pool. Uh, I think I'm in 616th place, something like that. I got Louisville. Um, currently, the overlay projects are coming to an end, so now we're going to see more and more how these networks perform. Um, at and Verizon have already rolled full speed into new sites. You know, we're all seeing more rings and they're, gonna, they're doing a lot more uh, densification. Sprint and Timo really totally consumed with modernization and, and uh, or network vision for Sprint and modernization for Timo. Probably we'll see them shift into more new sites late next year. I would predict second half of next year you'll start to see more of it. You might see it trickle out, but I think they're gonna be pretty consumed with what they're doing, and we've seen that with the other carriers. Um, I think rooftops and building facades are going to become increasingly important, uh, especially in the context of small cell. Um, and then we're going to see some churn, right? Uh, Sprint's going to eliminate sites from the acquisitions they've done. Timo will eliminate sites from Metro. We've seen this before. Uh, the amount that they eliminate always has been, generally has been a lot, a lot less than was originally predicted. I don't think that changes because the demand keeps going like that and time marches on. And by the time they plan it and implement it, they keep a lot more sites than they said they were. And uh, we're already seeing off the back end, IDEN sites that were IDEN only, that are IDEN only, are now being plucked by Sprint and saying, no, 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 I want to keep that. I want to transfer that into a different entity and keep that lease um, because they need it. They need the capacity. I don't think we're going to see any mergers among the top five, not real profound. But, uh, top, sorry, top four U.S. carriers, but definitely not during this administration. That's not happening. Um, I think that um, one interesting change that's happened in our industry in the last two years, three years, is the radios are now on the tower. So as new spectrum comes in to the hands of the carriers, to deploy that spectrum, we're going to see more amendment traffic on towers because the radios are on the tower. The RUs are up there. Those, are the, you know, those are the boxes that are supposed to be behind the antennas, but they're already a lot up there. But if they add new frequencies, so if um, Dish's spectrum comes to market, the RUs that are deployed don't don't work for 600 megahertz. They're going to have to deploy new RUs for that band. So if some of these bands come to market, we're going to see amendments to add these radios up on the tower. In the past, they would have added them within their confine. And if they didn't change the antennas, it wouldn't necessarily change anything. So that's, I think that's a pretty interesting shift for everybody. First net's coming. Um, I know Jonathan mentioned it uh, last night. And it's definitely coming. It seems to have picked up momentum from what I can tell. 
So I would think we'll actually see some definition this year and potentially a launch next year. Really not clear exactly how they're going to do it. It's almost certainly not going to be a greenfield deployment of, you know, X thousands of sites all over the country, de novo. It'll be some kind of combination of first net only sites plus using existing networks, at t Verizon, some kind of network sharing or wholesaling arrangement. So what about small cell? I get asked that a lot. Well, densification, even though we didn't call it that, has been going on for a long time, since I've been in the business, which is a long time. Um, in dog years, I'm like 200. Um, and small cells are not new. Uh, if you go to Manhattan, you will see small cells deployed on the corners of buildings at 25 feet all over Manhattan, and they've been there since the late 90s. Uh, it's just, it, it's just got a different buzz now. It's got a new name and a buzz. But I really think we have to, to, to really talk about small cells, you have to think about it as a, different, a few different flavors. One is in building. So there's Wi-Fi here, there's Wi-Fi in the hotel, there's Wi-Fi in the office. Think of those Wi-Fi routers, which even an idiot can install, right? Usually. Um, they will be LTE and licensed frequencies, right? Instead of unlicensed frequencies in 802. 11, whatever. Um, that's going to be called small cell. All the carriers are counting that as small cell. How does that work? They have a law firm. The law firm's complaining. You know, we're a corporate account for Verizon. We don't have good coverage. Verizon will ship them a box of these things and say, have your IT department hook them up in the drop ceiling using Ethernet cable. Problem solved. Done. I think that will be a lot of small cell indoor. You'll see a lot of that. Um, second flavor is outdoors. So this is the dense urban areas. Right now, DAS is fiber fed, it's pretty expensive, right? The cost to run it is pretty expensive, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles. Um, some of the talk and the buzz and excitement about small cells is how magically small cells are gonna be cheaper than DAS. Well, you still gotta backhaul them. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I got a call from somebody saying, oh, we're gonna do this national project and we're gonna do small cells and you know, I'm like, well, so how are you going to do your site acquisition? Well, we're getting rings. I said, really, what are the radius? 30 feet. <laughs> nice. And that's going to be cheaper? Okay. We'll see about that. But I do think backhaul is huge. And one thing I would encourage everybody to look into, if you haven't already, is the non-line of sight technology. Because if you think about it, uh, the targeted area for small cells is 25, 30 feet. Above, above the ground, okay? Line of sight microwave ain't gonna work. And I saw a study that said, line of sight at, at, a, at a seven, five and seven meter height for the antenna, so 25 feet, only 5% of those sites are gonna get line of sight backhaul, which isn't surprising. But non-line of sight can get that number up into the 80%. Range. So I think that technology has to come along to have a big deployment of small cell. Because again, think the facade of the building, all you need is power. You have a hub site somewhere and you put these non-line of sight antennas, they're not big, right? They're little patches with the RF antennas and that's your backhaul. And then lastly, what I would call smaller cells, which we've been doing forever, right? I mean. They used to go on the 40-story building. So it just keeps coming down and covering smaller areas because the demand is so thick that you, or dense that you need to have more and more cells. So I think these are all the flavors of small cells and we're gonna do, we'll see all of them deployed. Couple examples is, uh, one is what I call underlay. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, the left-hand side is just to repeat that, you know, how many small cells does it take to replace macros? But there's also niche plays. So small cells will definitely add capacity in key dense areas. Again, not that new, right? Think of a tower, a monopole on a highway where traffic is really bad and you have a sector right down on the road. It's not that different from that. That's what small cell is. Um, secondly, is filling. So where a site isn't performing well, yeah, it's small cell. I saw an, an analysis uh, on the plane here yesterday that said that the optimal performance 
for a macro cell is only delivered to 40% of the geographic area of that cell. So at the edge of the cell, the service to the customer is bad. The throughput is bad. So do you, do you split it and put another macro in, or do you try to pop a small cell in there? Some of both. Some of both. But the, the, the nature of small cell is we will see that. that if it can be done, cost effective. And that's really the wild part, right? While this is one estimate that I use, um, so far carriers really view small cell as complementary to their macro network. I think it'll always be there, that way. Uh, Alcatel Lucent estimated that 10% of the population would be covered by small cells long term. I think that's probably a little optimistic, but they have a reason to want to be optimistic. But this is a chart um, that I borrowed from CMA, which basically is the blue is the demand for, the, the total bar is the demand for macro sites, right? The red is what's replaced with small cell. So in their analysis, they say over time, 40,000 macro cells will be replaced with small cell. That equates to about 400,000 small cells. So it does replace some of the market and it equates to a huge number of small cells, but it really only works in very specific dense areas. And the ultimate, ultimate impact of small cells is gonna be a function of how much does it cost? So if you think about it, if it takes you 10 small cells to replace a macro cell, everything has to be one tenth. Right? The radios have to be one-tenth, the soft costs have to be one-tenth, the leasing, the lease cost, the power, the backhaul. Everything has to be one-tenth on average cost of ownership. Or why would anybody do it? The carriers won't do it because it's not economic. So I think that, if you think about it that way, it really boils it down to limited places where it's really valuable and lots and lots of places like Tunica, Mississippi, where outside of the building, it's not gonna happen. That's it. Um, you, you want me to take questions? I don't know if I, it looks like I'm almost like exactly on time. How'd that happen? Um, happy to take questions. I'll also be on the panel, so happy to take questions then, but if anybody has a question, who's not hungry? <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'll be around. You can always find me. If you buy me a beer, I'll answer your question.